Welcome, everyone. We are so happy you could join us for another fun and engaging natural resources and environment SIG. And this year actually marks our third annual of, of this event. And we actually already have a, around a thousand folks who have who have come into the SIG with many more joining as we speak. So we're really, really excited and looking forward to this. So I'm Mike Bialish, and I'm joined by my teammate, Sonny Fleming, and we are the state and local government environment and natural resources team, which gives us this amazing opportunity to work across the country, helping to address challenges faced by environmental and natural resources agencies. We will be facilitating most of the session today, and with us is Megan Martinez, who is our industry marketing, who's with our industry marketing group and is also focused in this space. And she will be moderating, especially as questions and comments come in. So the plan for today, let me get my PowerPoint moving. Okay, so the plan for today is uh, starting out, we're gonna just set some quick context on the purpose of the SIG, which is all around the you as the community. And then we'll have a rock star lineup of presenters who are peers of yours doing amazing work and truly making a difference with technology usage in their states, and especially related to the shifts that we've all faced since 2020. We will then have some time for questions uh, related to these presentations. And I will mention now to please enter those questions as we go in the session Q&A panel, and we will have time and we'll get to as many as we can in the time that we have. Then Sonny and I have some polls set up to continue gathering feedback from you all to help focus our efforts, but also for all of us to see where there are opportunities for collaboration. We then have some resources we put together for all of you, which we will share at the end as well. Now I mentioned polls uh, toward the end, but we also have these throughout the session and we would love for you to participate um, in those. Okay, so getting right into it, and speaking of the community, and we should actually have our first poll coming up right now um, for that. We all know the theme of the conference this year, right? GIS creating a sustainable future. And we heard Jack and many other speaker and many other speakers discuss how important it is to apply holistic geographic approaches to gain necessary understanding and then applying that to deal with the many evolving changes we face around sustainability, climate change, biodiversity, social equity, and so on. And you know, as I was listening to Jack, this particular slide resonated with me as these are all challenges and issues that we as an environment and natural resources community are at the forefront of. And as we move forward, we especially need to continue taking a leading role in shifting our priorities towards these challenges. And as Jack and particularly uh, Secretary Crowfoot from California discussed, we need to do this collectively as a community. And just look at the poll results already and the wide variety of folks that are here. This is exactly what the secretary especially was talking about. And what this really means is that we need to apply the best technology, science, and holistic geographic approaches in collaboration with each other, as these challenges are so cross-cutting across our community, as well as with other disciplines as well. And this is really the spirit behind the SIG and where we hope it provides a venue for us to collaborate, learn from each other, establish and further our relationships, and really collectively address these common challenges that we all face. Now, the other element that Jack and others conveyed is that we're doing a lot of this work already. And this is especially true in our particular community, which I know I am just super proud of. And you have to look no further than the wide variety of natural resources oriented SAG award winners this year. I always like to take this time to not only acknowledge these organizations and their achievements, but also to note the wide variety of winners who are doing extremely innovative work at all levels of government and related organizations. And on critical issues that matter, again, to the health and sustainability of our critical natural resources and at all scales. I think this really illustrates the message that Jack was conveying, as well as just the great work happening in this space and something that we can all frankly take advantage of by coming together like this. I also want to take a moment to recognize the South Carolina DNR Natural Heritage Program, who was awarded the Environment and Natural Resources Specific Industry SAG Award this year for their awesome work around modernizing how rare, threatened, and endangered species data is managed, accessed, distributed to stakeholders, and made available to the public. They're just such a deserving winner and their work, you know, speaks to everything around the conference theme and is truly inspiring and sets an amazing example. So definitely kudos to them. 
I also want to take a little time to further recognize the work that you all are already doing related to our critical challenges. And to that end, we asked you to submit examples uh, prior to the conference and the SIG. And Sonny and I actually picked out a few of these that really resonated with us. So starting with some environmental protection examples, we see a great dashboard from Nebraska DNR that enables water users, water managers, and the public to visualize excess flow availabilities and overall monitoring of flow rates in real time, which is just awesome. In Michigan, they're using ArcGIS Insights and Story Maps to visualize and communicate wastewater sampling results to understand and prevent the spread of COVID-19. Just really important and innovative work. We see awesome work across state geological surveys, such as leveraging modernized tools and approaches to deliver a wide variety of geologic content in a usable way, such as in Pennsylvania and Missouri. We see forestry agencies across the country, such as in Tennessee, West Virginia, and Hawaii, communicating the impacts that forestry has on the economy at all scales, communicating how violations are resolved on managed lands, and even engaging stakeholders in the public as forest reserve management plans are developed, and then keeping these communities engaged as plans are implemented. Continuing on, our fisheries and wildlife agencies are just doing fantastic work, such as up in Maine around bald eagle recovery efforts and how they continue to leverage geographic approaches and tools, as well as story maps to communicate all of this to the public. Utah DNR, man, they, they just do some amazing uh, monitoring, often in real time, of fish and wildlife populations. And we just love this dashboard illustrating the genetic status of cutthroat trout populations based on genetic sampling across the state over the last several years. Now, this is kind of a preview of some of what you will see in our user presentations today. But if there's anywhere where there's been an explosion of innovation lately, it's in the parks and recreation space where organizations have been rallying to map, manage, and communicate around assets and amenities, such as what um, Missouri State Parks has done, as well as truly engaging stakeholders around things like SCORP plans and greenways and trails planning, such as this example from New York State Parks and Recreation. And then, wow, the work our agricultural agencies are doing, such as in Florida, where a wealth of content and solutions have been deployed around assuring citrus health, ensuring food safety, monitoring pests and diseases, and so on. And then, you know, I had to add Michigan's craft beverage industry story map, not only because I might partake in the occasional craft beverage or two, um, but this also really tells the story of the importance of this industry to Michigan's economy and how sustainable management of these resources is approached and tools to engage with these businesses and so on. So again, just amazing work across the community and there's just so much more where that came from and we actually have more for you on that later. So, and speaking of that, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna dive in much deeper uh, with our user presentations. And so what I'm gonna do now is turn it over to Sonny, who's gonna lead us through these and really how all of this important work that I was just uh, talking about has been impacted and has really shifted, especially of late with all the events that are taking place. So Sonny, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Mike. So yes, 2020 has drastically impacted how we conduct this important work. And I think one of the highest profile impacts revolves around an increased demand for information on outdoor recreation opportunities. So for our first session this morning, we will hear from one state uh, how they reacted to this public's renewed interest in our public lands and delivered the resources necessary straight to their guests' hands. I'll hand it to Ohio to kick us off. Ohio? Welcome everybody. Um, I am so very excited to be here. Uh, I'm Jeff Swan. I'm the Chief Information Officer in Ohio DNR. And I'm Donovan Powers, the GIS Manager for Ohio DNR. Bill Hoffman, Program Manager with the Ohio Division of Parks and Watercraft. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, before we get into the details uh, of the presentation, I'd like to start with a short video. Mike?
that video gets me every time, no matter how many times I watch it. Um, but now let's go for a detour. So our goal throughout this project, you know, was to always focus on having a go-to resource, you know, for all trails in Ohio. You know, the two main objectives, and they're not the only ones, but the two main ones, was to develop a comprehensive and statewide geographic database for trails. Also, displaying this data was so very important with our new mobile and desktop application. Our journey was vast. You know, data collaboration definitely, you know, went to the top. Um, it was two years in the making. You know, the vision plan involved a variety of stakeholders across Ohio, included but not limited to trail advocates, planners, park managers, and our end users. And last, but certainly not least, um, you know, with integration, you know, with our GIS enterprise database. You know, that's going to give us the ability to continue to grow and make this the best um, application for our divisions. Just so happens, you know, one of our core values is do the right thing the right way. And honestly, this project, you know, is a perfect example of that. We absolutely did the right thing for our customers and we did it the right way that will help us continue to grow and mature for years to come. I'm so very proud of the team and what they've been able to do with this application along the way. And it, it was truly a team effort. Um, I just wanna thank everybody. And now I'm going to hand it over to Phil Hoffman for additional scope information and a short video of the mobile app. Thanks, Jeff. From the beginning, we wanted to provide end users with authoritative data about the recreational trails in Ohio. Detour had to be easy to use and available on multiple platforms. Users had to be able to search by viewing a map or by entering text. Detour had to support an offline function where an end user can download a map and track their progress via GPS. Lastly, we needed end users to authenticate and create a profile in order to store favorite trails and recorded trips by using the state of Ohio's official user authentication platform. So let's take a very quick look at the Detour mobile app. From the very beginning of Detour's development, we wanted to make it easy for people to find trails. Using the distance selector in the app, users can search by a radius up to 25 miles. In this example, I'm selecting a radius of 10 miles and I see that 64 trails are available. As a Detour user, I can see all of the trails that are around me. The available trails are represented as information cards with high level details. Additional information and the map is revealed when a card is selected. I can zoom and pan to find other trails nearby or across the state. I can also use the search bar by entering the first part of a trail's name. When a trail is selected, it's highlighted on a map with the trail card below and other trail options are still visible nearby. When I expand the trail card, I can see all of the data attributes that Donovan will talk about in just a moment. Attributes like allowed uses, a trail description, special restrictions, minimum maximum elevation, and links to the managing agency and local trail websites. By selecting the get here button, Detour will open up my driving navigation app and present me with turn by turn directions to the trailhead. Creating a profile and logging in allows me to do even more with Detour. I can choose offline mode to select, download, and access offline maps. And if you've ever used a navigation app, and I'm betting most of you have, you know how frustrating they can sometimes be to use out in remote areas. Now I can take Detour out of town, far outside the reach of cell towers, and still see all of my relevant trail information, including points of interest and trail photos. Detour also allows me to record a trip, even when I'm offline. I can track and record my progress 
in my favorite park or forest. But I don't need to be on a trail. I can record a trip anywhere, even a walk around the block near my home. Detour records the distance I've traveled along with the elapsed time. I can take notes, attach a photo, and give my trip a custom name. Finally, users can provide feedback through Detour, which utilizes ArcGIS Survey123. This allows us to receive input from users to help us clearly see where we can make improvements to the app and where we've hit our target. Users also have the ability to report a trail problem. This provides actionable information to both ODNR trail managers and our external trail data providers. Now Donovan will talk about the data used by Detour. Thanks, Phil. So you've heard about the goals of the application and you saw a quick demo. Now let's talk about the data that drives the app. So next slide. Um, currently we have 7,000 miles of trails. We didn't start that way. We did a soft launch initially with just DNR trails. And then about three or four weeks later, we added on another wave of partner data. So we've been growing this periodically over the last four months uh, when we launched in April. Next slide. So initial trail data was primarily geometry. This is before we even started this detour project. After scoping detour, we quickly realized that we needed a lot more attributes in order to meet the functionality goals of the app. So we quickly launched a few easy to develop applications using ArcGIS Collector and Field Maps and ArcGIS Online Web App Builder so that we could get this data out to our constituents to start adding more attributes. We also did a data schema change so that we could apply 22 different coded value domains just to the trail lines themselves. And we launched those apps and data collection and cleanup was even easier because those apps quickly integrate easily into everything that we need to do to make this app work. Uh, next slide, please. So we also had some geometry cleanup in there and I probably got ahead of myself, but uh, we use ArcGIS Pro uh, with topology tools to clean up some of that geometry. Um, here, so we start with trail segments. That's kind of the smallest uh, segment of, of the line work that we use. Uh, but we quickly realized that we needed to have something a little more user friendly in the application. So we started dissolving the trails as well. And that's based off of a few different attributes, um, trail primary name, and alternate names and managed areas, things like that. Uh, we also created a data set called featured routes. And what those are, are scenic and popular routes that uh, we know a lot of people want to use. Um, and then we also created a network data set and that's gonna be used for our turn by turn directions. Next slide. So within here, you can see that we've got additional data within our, our map. We have points of interest and we needed to use points of interest to kind of add a little more usability to the application. Points of interest include parking, campgrounds, restrooms, uh, lodges, things like that. So we created a whole data set for all that information as well. And it too has a robust schema with a lot of uh, coded value domains. Um, we also created a custom vector tile base map, which is includes uh, forested areas, uh, contour elevations, uh, typical things that you would see in a hiking map. And oh, don't forget the robust search function. That in and of itself is probably half the size of this application. That allows the user not only search by trail names, but also areas, uh, county township, park, you name it. And we're adding more functionality to that as we go. So next slide. So we're, we're gonna continue to add on to this. Um, as we built it, we started hearing from a lot of people to add their data. So it's truly a build it and they'll come kind of scenario. Um, we've got over 3,500 uh, hub, ArcGIS Hub community users. And that's kind of how we built this was uh, so that we could include the users that could download and create their own data and be part of, of this whole community. So. When you go into the app and you create an account for those additional features, your account's actually out in ArcGIS Hub and it's one of our community licenses. Um, 
we've got uh, future enhan enhancements in mind too. We plan on having real-time trail closures. And like I mentioned before, those turn-by-turn -turn directions. We've got over 15,000 installations of the mobile apps between the Apple Store and the Google Play Store. Next slide. So if you're interested in learning more, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, there's a link to the webpage that you can see the app and download it. And there's a QR code there for you as well. Thank you. Great. All right, so we're actually going to throw a poll up right now. And uh, this poll is going to ask, is your organization looking to develop a centralized trail inventory? So make sure you go to the poll and check that out and answer that one. We'll be curious what the responses are. So um, our next up, let me get to my queue. Hold on. All right. So, um, you know, Ohio mentioned Hub a little bit and Kentucky was also able to leverage Hub for a very focused mission. Um, whew, all right, I'm getting off script here, hang on. So providing the public with all these kinds of great experiences um, in the outdoors is a great way to ensure we value our natural resources into the future. So on this other side of the house, um, engagement around policy and regulation is also going to play a key role in building the sustainable future starting now. So our next presenters will teach us how they embrace the Esri platform to deliver a key planning tool that brought everyone together on the same page. Please show us the light, Kentucky. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kenya Stump, and with me today is Melissa Miracle, and we're going to take you through our solar siting potential initiative that we have here in Kentucky. So my name is Kenya Stump. I'm uh, the executive director of the Kentucky Office of Energy Policy. And I believe in the next slide, we're gonna go over a little bit about what our office does, where it's located and how this uh, project came to evolve. So we are located here at the Energy and Environment Cabinet in Kentucky, where our mission is to provide regulatory guidance, environmental awareness, and implement an energy strategy that'll bring economic benefit to the Commonwealth. We do this while protecting the environment and improving the quality of life for Kentucky businesses, workers, and the public in general. Our philosophy here in Kentucky is that energy and environmental issues are inextricably linked, and that is why we work hand in hand together on energy and environmental policy issues. My office here is the Kentucky Office of Energy Policy. We're a non-regulatory office. As you can tell by our name, our focus is on energy policy. We want to really provide effective, creative, and flexible pathways forward and look to meet our energy needs in a, a holistic and integrated manner. We are non-regulatory. We support all Kentucky's energy resources and find ways to utilize those resources for the betterment of the Commonwealth while protecting and improving our environment. Central to our work is data and policy analysis. And even more core to that is our work that we do with our uh, environmental partners as it relates to energy and environmental GIS work, which is why we're here today. Next slide. So why did we look at solar site suitability in Kentucky? Um, many of you probably don't think of Kentucky when you think of solar. But we, as the cost of utility scale solar decline, declined to the point of becoming competitive, especially as a least cost resource, we were seeing a lot of interest from developers uh, in the Commonwealth as siting locations for projects. Uh, it is land intensive compared to our other energy resources. And then that naturally brings up conversations around greenfield development, brownfield development, land use, and inevitably, where do these projects make sense uh, from a technical feasibility standpoint? Next slide. So part of that is 
our cabinet is focused on energy and environmental justice issues. Many of our mining communities have uh, experienced uh, a disproportionate adverse impact as the market demand for our coal resources uh, have declined in, in the last 10 years. So we have a lot of mining lands um, that are looking for opportunities to be uh, revitalized and reused. And part of that is the conversation of um, can solar make sense on reclaimed mine sites? This tool was also there to really help prepare local governments to know does solar, large scale utility solar, um, is that feasible in their communities and how can they prepare for it? And then lastly, it does look at a kind of infrastructure gap analysis. When we look at areas that may not score as suitable, then what are those limiting infrastructure factors um, that come into play in that kind of analysis? Next slide. So now I'm really pleased to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Melissa Miracle, who's gonna take you through our so solar site suitability uh, hub site and um, how we came to develop it and a little bit of where we're going with site suitability in the state. Kenya, <clears throat> hi, I'm Melissa, and I'm here to talk about the technology behind the solar siding project, but after watching two fantastic plenaries and a whole host of great information this week, I feel compelled to tie our presentation to the conference themes. Now, this project focuses on developing reclaimed coal mine lands to house a source of renewable energy, and clearly it has both sustainability and environmental justice themes running all through it. And as you know, these are clear themes of the conference. Um, but I also noticed in the secondary, the second plenary this week, an underlying theme of learning, planning, doing, and building on what you've done to reiterate that process and move forward. And I think you're going to see that in the Kentucky Energy and Environment Cabinet, this is exactly what we're doing in our GIS projects. So how do we get started? Well, we began by gathering together a group of experts in our cabinet to talk about the data and information we want to share with solar developers. And from that, we created those data, we created layers, and we published those as services. Those services were pulled into a web map, and then we took that web map into the RGS web app builder and created a web app. Next, we took that web app and we shared it with our project team to get those experts to look at it and give us their feedback. We took that feedback and incorporated it into the viewer and then we showed it again to our management team. We wanted to get their feedback. We took feedback from our management team, added to the app, and then we were ready to show it to our solar developers. We had a team of solar developers that we demoed this to and they had a lot of great feedback to give us we took all that and we finalized our app. But as we looked at all of the feedback we got from all of our stakeholders, we realized we had a lot more information we wanted to share than we could do in just a web app. So we decided to use ArcGIS Hub as a platform and to use it to showcase the web app, but to add all that other information we wanted to share. So this is a screen capture of our hub site, and it is on the solar siding web app page, uh, which is called the suitability tool page. And now I'm just going to take us over to a quick video to show the app. In this video, I will be doing a quick walkthrough of the solar siding potential in Kentucky map viewer that is located on the solar siding potential hub site on the suitability tool page. When you first come in to the map, you have two layers that are visible at the statewide view. It's the filtered mine boundaries and the solar suitability model. If we look at the legend, we see that the filtered mine boundaries are the pink polygons and the solar suitability model is a raster that has all the modeling criteria that we explain in our project criteria page on the hub site. And it is represented by a color ramp that goes from green to orange, with green being the best siting potentials and orange being the worst. The gray on the map are areas that are not available for siting. 
There are other layers that are available, as you can see. We cannot see those at the statewide view, but when we zoom in, we will be able to see those. I'm going to zoom in by searching for a particular filtered mine boundary. Click on that, and now I can look at my layer list, and I can see that they're all turned on, except for the service areas and the farmland classifications. These particular layers were added because when we did our demo with the solar developers, they felt like these data would be important for them to have available in the map, but there are so many features in each layer that we by default have those turned off. Another feature that we've added is a slider, and this allows the user to slide the purple mine boundary polygons on or off the map. If I look at the pop-up for the filtered mine boundary, We've also added a few things to this layer that are visible in the pop-up. One of the key things is the possible acres, which is the number of acres that could possibly be used to create a solar farm based on the project criteria from the project criteria page, and also the total acres. If I scroll down and click on this link to the permit info, this will open up a new page for the Surface Mining Information Systems public website, it goes straight to that particular coal company and I click on that company and then all of the publicly available permitting information is visible. I'm going to go back to my map and show one last thing. And this is that we have all of the layers that are in the map. We have the attributes data available to be viewed so the developer can hone in on a particular site and then see information from each of these layers. So now I want to talk a little bit about future work. Uh, we elevated this project by working on creating several 3D map scenes to add to the solar site and I've got a couple of screen grabs so you can see what that looks like. We also continue to elevate, refine, and add to our project by creating a new project, which we're finalizing. It's a joint project with the Cabinet for Economic Development to do site suitability using the suitability modeler widget. And this is the same widget the US Forest Service demoed in the first plenary. Uh, it allows us to add a lot more layers, including social and environmental justice layers. And you can see a screen cap of a model that we ran using this widget with our unemployment rates laying on top of that. Now, as I mentioned, we, we saw this theme of uh, learning, planning, and doing, and we were now back to our learning phase. After doing all of this work, we realized that we have a couple of rock stars in our cabinet who can do this work, who can create rasters and, and work with imagery and do suitability modeling, but we need to train more people. So we're going to leverage our ESRI Advantage program to get more staff trained to do these kinds of things. And then we're planning to use ArcGIS Pro to do more in-depth spatial analysis and suitability modeling. And now I'm just leaving you with our contact information. Uh, to feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And we also have our URL as well as a QR code to our hub site. We really hope you go out and check the hub site out because in this short demo and time, we didn't have enough time to show you all of the, the great things about it. I just want to thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much. That was excellent. So um, we have a little quiz going now, and that will be around what widget does Kentucky use to power the site suitability web app tool? So hopefully folks will go check that quiz out and I think get the answer right. So um, Kentucky was able to leverage Hub for this very focused mission, right, of commuting what communicating why and how the solar siding tool was built in easy to understand terms without watering down the science behind it. So they were able to democratize access to the tool and wrap it around really engaging context. This is a new pattern of conducting business and one that we've seen grow exponentially as 2020 forced us all to work in new ways. So next, we're going to hear from how one state park agency took the opportunity to innovate how they conduct their internal business and how this is shaping a more sustainable future for their operations. Tennessee, show us how it's done. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Schultz, and I'm the GIS lead for the Tennessee Bureau of Parks and Conservation. Hey, everybody. I'm Andrew McDonough, and I am the GIS specialist. 
And we are thrilled to be here presenting to the Natural Resources and Environment SIG on how our COVID-19 response work has fueled our web GIS and mobile GIS initiatives in 2021. When Safer at Home orders were first enacted in March of 2020, Tennessee State Park saw a massive, unprecedented surge in visitation as Tennesseans turned to outdoor recreation as a safe haven in the pandemic. For the safety of our visitors and staff, the decision was made to close our statewide system of parks temporarily, and we immediately got to work preparing to safely reopen. We used the ArcGIS Online suite of tools to rapidly deploy a series of web and mobile GIS solutions. ArcGIS Online enabled park management to make spatial data-driven solutions around visitation numbers, personal protective equipment, COVID cases in parks, and more. These decision-making tools allowed us to swiftly reopen parks to the public with confidence, and we used GIS to keep the public up to date about temporary closures. Our PP&E and cleaning supply dashboard tracks the supply and demand for PPE items like disposable gloves and masks around the system, allowing area managers to make decisions about purchasing and redistributing supplies. Our COVID-19 data tracker utilizes an integration of ArcGIS Survey123 in ArcGIS Experience Builder to solicit weekly updates from park managers on case count, staff capacity, and other concerns. The park alerts map on tnstateparks.com was developed using ArcGIS Web App Builder and consumes information directly from our website API so that updates to a park status on the website automatically cascade to the map. This keeps visitors up to date on any park closures or partial closures. So fast forward to 2021. We've long since retired most of our COVID tools as PPE has become readily available and park staff have adjusted to our new normal. But the engagement with GIS we saw during the pandemic outbreak continues to inspire GIS use today. In the wake of COVID-19, we are shifting away from keeping the GIS in the hands of a few analysts and toward empowering all of our staff to become lightweight GIS users themselves. By July 31st of this year, we intend to have every ranger across the system equipped with an ArcGIS online field worker license so they can do more with GIS. We started a quarterly newsletter we call Smart Parks Bits and Bytes to share GIS success stories from our park rangers, updates on our GIS tools, free ESRI training plans, and more. And we've revamped and revitalized our internal facing hub platform, the Smart Parks Command Hub. The new and improved Smart Parks Command Hub is built on ArcGIS Hub Basic. The Command Hub serves park staff both in the field and in the central office as their one-stop shop for WebGIS tools and resources. Resources. We've organized our hub pages by division or major work group. The meat of our hub is in these main sections, which collect tools for the Parks and Conservation Leadership Team and our Park Operations Team, or Rangers. We plan to expand this selection soon with customized tool collections for all the divisions we support, including conservation, facilities and land management, state parks marketing, and more. The flexibility of the hub site builder allows us to integrate all of our resources cleanly in one place. We don't just link to GIS apps on the command hub. Here you can see that we've embedded a relevant YouTube video right next to links to download GeoReference PDF maps. We aim to empower our users to make their own maps using our Smart Parks Data Viewer application. We're able to include both a link to the tool here and a video tutorial right here on the Maps page on the Command Hub, so staff are directed to these solutions anytime they come searching for a map. As GIS use gains traction among park staff, we're committed to providing our lightweight users with all the necessary training. ESRI makes this simple by providing a wealth of free and maintenance required web courses on ESRI Academy. We've curated free learning plans specific to Smart Park's WebJS workflows, which we promote here on our hub. ArcGIS Hub Basic enables us to funnel all of the tools and resources our park staff need to complete their GIS workflows into one convenient cloud location. 
Looking into the future, we'll continue building out our hub to make WebJS workflows even simpler for our park rangers. And so now I'm going to pass it over to Andrew. All right. Well, WebGIS has become an enterprise solution, allowing us to make applications such as our leadership dashboard shown here. Conversations with each division help provide transparency and track our collective goals for the year 2023. This dashboard shown here offers a quick look and pulls in multiple data sources to track our progress towards these goals. They can include deferred maintenance projects and even the remaining mileage we have left to complete for our 300 mile Cumberland Trail. The economic dashboard is an internal and public facing application that shows how park visitation impacts the park's communities in the state. In 2020, our park's impact to Tennessee was $1.8 billion. Beyond visitation though, it shows how our larger park investment projects such as remodeling our state park lodges bring in tourism dollars. We can also look at this and compare visitation in 2019 to 2020 to see how some parks felt the pressure of that increased visitation while others with COVID closures of hotels and restaurants and even outfitter restrictions such as how many people can be in a boat for whitewater rafting, it resulted in a decrease of money brought into the counties and state. Lastly, I wanna show you guys uh, an application that was a great example of how we brought JS to a new division. This is the programs resource management and interpretation application that we did with our division of interpretation programming education. The previous resource management inventory oracle database was time intensive, requiring rangers to log into the state network in their park offices at the end of the day. And it lacked the fields and filters needed to provide a succinct snapshot of what goes on at their parks. Our new programs and resource management inventory application is an ArcGIS dashboard. This tracks attendance and the programs and events that occur at every single state park and natural area. This is a mobile system. It was built on Survey123. It contains lots of logic. It helps us see many more fields than we had before and track data throughout them. We can see the program types, the topics, whether they are part of larger events, and the attendance. At the very bottom, rangers can also attach their photos or even say where they worked at the state park along a trail or at a specific historic site. They can upload files that talk about the itinerary and the topics that were discussed during their presentations. More fields means more data and analysis. At the end of every month, park managers can see the dashboard and how their park performed. By typing in their park, they can see the program attendance, the event attendance, how many were fee-based or non-fee-based. They can even see how long it took to plan their events and the cost of their expenditures. Area managers can quickly select multiple parks, removing the need for a chain of command that reports up to them. To dig deeper, staff can also hop on over to the Survey123 analysis page to perform more powerful searches and print reports. They can see trends in the programs offered or filter by a single ranger's name to see their programs over the time period of one summer season. They can develop curriculum that occurs over multiple years for students to visit the park with their schools. Notes on their Survey123 application allow rangers to put in what was successful or what were some takeaways from their programs. A really great point is the photos that were uploaded earlier can be searched and found again. You can look at the survey, and in this case, a rock climbing program was put on by four different rangers from four different parks working together off site. This is something that the previous RMI could not do. It allows them to see what was successful about this program, the topics that were covered, and we can see all these photos. So if they wanna create this program next year, they can use this for marketing materials. These tools offer a fast, smart, filterable view and reports and statistics on the trends in park programming throughout the state. And that's all we have for you. Here's our contact information. You can reach us via email, uh, visit our hub site, our public facing hub site at gis.tnstateparks.com or use the QR code to take you right there. Thank you all so much.
Thank you. All right, that was awesome. So we have a new quiz and that is what did Tennessee use to deliver a command center for all their park operations and training resources? So everyone head over there and answer the quiz question. So in 2020, we were all scrambling to react, but this year we wanted to reflect on what it's meant for our environment and natural resource users and what the lasting impacts seem to be. So these three presentations are great examples of some of the major themes we thought summarized the impacts of COVID on our industry. It really showed us, um, showed everyone how important our public lands are for quality of life and refocused and renewed our collective interest in public lands. Demand for information and transparency had us rethinking how we conduct environmental regulation and respond to emerging topics such as environmental justice. But the changes weren't just outward. Our virtual environment shone a light on, a tra on the traditional ways of conducting business, and it's forcing us all to modernize and adapt in a big way, pivoting our workforce and operations. We hope that these user stories resonated with you. We're going to pass it over to our moderator, Megan, to facilitate some Q&A before moving on with some fun interactions. So Megan, let's get this rolling. Okay, well, thank you everyone for all the questions. Unfortunately, we don't have much time left, but I'll get started. Um, the first one is for Ohio. Um, was this app made in-house or by a vendor? So, <clears throat> this is Jeff Swan, I can, I can address that. Um, for this particular project, we did decide to uh, partner with a vendor. You know, that vendor was actually Esri. Um, you know, it was a great experience, you know, but one thing that I touched on, I could probably spend like a half hour talking about data collaboration, you know, but I cannot emphasize enough, you know, um, data collaboration and bringing that all together, you know, as a team, you know, really helped the application, both the web and the mobile, you know, fall into place. Um, so if you ever go through this experience, you know, please you know, focus as much as you can on the data collaboration. Okay, well, thank you, Jeff. And um, a question for Kentucky. What was the biggest hurdle in getting the solar siting project completed? I'll take this one. Uh, this is Kenya. The biggest hurdle is uh, we had data from natural resources, environmental protection, and energy coming together. The biggest hurdle was actually understanding data and, and how and what it meant. So what we found, it, it wasn't enough just to make data more transparent, but we had to really facilitate the use of that data in the realm of economic development. So understanding uh, natural resource, mining process, reclamation process, regulatory structure, environmental protection uh, attributes. Uh, and then of course, you, you put energy in the mix and um, we all really had to come together in again, a cross collaborative team that spanned Department of Natural Resource, Environmental Protection and Energy. So the biggest challenge was actually where we all start is what does, what does the data mean? and how do we facilitate the use of that, uh, and in this instance, for um, renewed economic development opportunities. Thank you, Kenya. And one question for Tennessee. It is great to see the distribution of GIS capabilities to more staff. How are you going about training those staff? Yeah, so um, as I went over briefly in the hub demo, we have uh, utilized Esri's free academy, learning academy to build specific uh, workflows, or I'm sorry, uh, learning plans tailored to our specific workflows. Uh, we distribute these through our newsletter. We also have plans to implement some sort of uh, testing where folks will have to complete certain trainings before we incre increase their license level in ArcGIS Online. Thank you, Rachel. And um, unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions right now because I want to leave some more um, time for some more um, feedback from you guys. But if we didn't get to your question, you can always um, reach out to our presenters. Their names are listed below this video and you can try to connect with them directly. So now I'll hand it over to Mike. All right, thanks, Megan. And I just wanna extend another thank you to all of you uh, for all the great questions. As we said, we'll follow up with the ones we didn't get to and to all our presenters too, for their amazing presentations. 
Um, so we have a few minutes left and we'd like to spend it getting additional feedback from all of you, uh, which certainly helps us at Esri, you know, not only focus our efforts, but also for all of us, like I said earlier, to see where we can collaborate around critical issues and challenges as a community. And so we're going to start off thinking back to a couple of the case studies from Monday's plenary, the first of which is the USDA Forest Service. So if we can call up the poll now. Um, the Forest Service discussed their big map efforts to model forest cover nationwide and then publish these, publish these results to the Living Atlas for everyone to use. Uh, some examples included forest carbon pools, forest stocking and productivity, and how this content could then be leveraged for so many challenges related to sustainability like we've all been talking about. So we have a couple of related polls, the first of which has been up here for, for a minute or so. Do you currently leverage resources from the Living Atlas? And so, Sunny, what are, what are we seeing here? All right, it's coming rolling in. We've got close to 80 responses so far. And most everyone, 53% says, yes, I love Living Atlas, but I still see 40% out of you that are data junkies. So, you know, we got to get away from that. Um, Living Atlas is amazing. There's a ton of resources. It keeps getting better every day. So I encourage you all to check it out. Absolutely. And the flexibility with how you can use it just continues to increase. So definitely check it out. All right, moving on a little from there, um, the Forest Service also announced the release of the Forest Inventory and Analysis Geospatial Data Showcase Hub, um, cool. which they described as a meeting place to share complex science and data and to collaborate and empower stakeholder efforts to take advantage of these resources. So our poll question is, are you currently leveraging ArcGIS Hub or other ESRI products to communicate scientific data? Sunny, what do we got there? All right, so our numbers are rising on responses here. We have a lot that are saying not at this time, um, but we do also have a ton of people saying yes, other Esri apps, tons of story map responses here, some hub, some premium, um, some experience builder, so that's great. So we definitely encourage you all to kind of leverage these different tools and apps to communicate that scientific data. We saw from Kentucky that, you know, they really took that to heart and they've got something out there that's really great and easy for everyone to use. 100%. All right, that's great. All right, we wanna move on now to thinking about the Telluride case study, which of course highlighted an amazing ski resort, which is very near and dear to my own heart. But I know as we watch this, we could easily equate it to a piece of public land, you know, a state or a local park, a wildlife management area, state forest and so on. And so in this, they highlighted using their cloud-based GIS to manage the mountain and its wide variety of assets, which included things like ArcGIS Velocity for real-time operational awareness, geofencing alerts to staff in the field, and creating a digital twin of the mountain, or as we're equating it to a park. So we wanted to ask, is your organization looking at cloud-based solutions for managing public land operations? Sunny, what are we seeing here? All right, also a ton of responses coming in here and we are at almost a 50-50 split. So there's a lot of yes, a lot of desire to, and then there's a, a lot of no. So I think one of those major themes that we saw coming out of 2020 is that when COVID hit, we all had to work from home. Immediately agencies were really looking at, oh my gosh, how do we really leverage cloud solutions? So as you know, um, there's a ton of cloud solutions available on the Esri platform. And we've been really working really closely with all of our state agencies around that. So definitely get in touch. Yeah, just so much to take advantage of there. And, you know, I'm sure there's a few folks in the audience who have a small GIS staff, right? And don't and can't handle, you know, or necessarily manage the overhead. So awesome. All right, uh, continuing on uh, this particular case study, it also illustrated tracking a ton of land management activities and statuses, all of which were being mapped and the resulting data heavily used in support of decisions made around snowmaking, potential avalanches and opening or closing terrain. With that in mind and knowing all the various land management activities happening on public and managed lands, we wanted to ask, do you currently map out your land management activities? So Sunny? All right, so we have a resounding yes here, which is really exciting to see. We do have a few no's, um, but a lot of desire to as well. So um, one of the things about this that really struck me during that plenary was that blending mode and how they use that for wildfires. And immediately I thought, well, that's really cool. We could use that, yes, for prescribed fire, for maybe where we're doing different kinds of land management and using those blending modes to really visualize that and take that home. So I'm excited to tinker with that. I hope our users are too. 
I, I was completely blown away by it too and just saw so much opportunity to leverage that capability. All right, cool. Um, lastly, we have a couple of simple polls, uh, starting with this one that's coming up now. Um, what topics of interest do you wanna see in the environment natural resources SIG next year? Again, we ask this to help shape these events as well as other events such as webinars that we conduct throughout the year. So Sunny, um, what are we seeing in the word cloud? Okay, I'm wondering if I can, oh, conservation is the first and foremost thing I see. We've got- awesome. One response though, so kudos to you. Let's see what else comes in. Oh, okay, here we go. Public input, wetlands. Oh man, now it's coming at me. Whoo, environmental justice. Oh my gosh, wildlife, trail finders. Okay, wow, this is coming at me fast. I, there's a ton here. Biodiversity, stormwater, prescribed fire. All right, this is awesome. Land management, this is great input, everybody. Climate change, really big on the screen right now. Awesome. No, this great, great, great input. All right. And last poll, I promise, uh, in one or a couple of words, what is your biggest operational priority right now? And I think we all understand the, the, the spirit of this question, you know, how we're orienting our technology and solutions and how we can collaborate together. So Sunny, any responses coming in there? Oh, just yes. Yet? Tons. Cool. Prescribed fires real big, water resources, um, wildlife monitoring, forestry, Oh gosh, I just feel like I'm giving a shout out to everyone. All right, trail apps, trail maintenance, parks. Oh gosh, so much here. Climate change impacts, education. Love that one near and dear to my heart. Uh, habitat, groundwater, all sorts of stuff. But water resources looks like it is winning out. Data management, always a big deal. Efficiency popped up for a while. All right, good stuff. All right, awesome. Again, thank you everyone. Uh, that concludes our polls. And um, we really, really appreciate the input. We'll take it to heart and, um, you know, really, again, just really appreciate it. So speaking of collaboration, like we were just doing with the polls, um, we'd have uh, developed some leave behind resources for, for you all um, today. And um, a lot of this is based on input and feedback and conversations that we've had with you already. Um, but there, there's several tools in here within this story map, definitely grab the QR code and the link. Um, around, you know, engaging and for providing further, further feedback as, as we move forward. Um, also contains a lot of specific information to the SIG this year and the great presentations that we saw, but also resources for us to continue collaborating. I want to point out a couple of quick things in the minute or two we have left. Um, again, we've got surveys in here to continue grabbing feedback from you all around the themes we heard this year, around future topics for SIGs. So if you didn't, you know, if you want to think about it a little more and get us more feedback, it's a great way to do that. Um, in addition, I mentioned that we uh, got examples from across the community um, in preparation for the, for the SIG. Um, I highlighted a few of those, but um, all of them are available to you in here within this dashboard that you can check out individually or by state. And then we also got um, a lot of requests from you for more information about particular products and topics and things like that. And so our awesome Esri training advisors have put together this really nice story map, which is integrated in here as well, that really specifically hone in on training and learning opportunities relative to those um, requests that you have. And we'll continue to keep that updated. So that concludes our session. Definitely, we want your feedback, as we've said many times. So definitely fill out uh, the session survey, which you can see here illustrated on the screen. We, we do take that to heart and it really steers, you know, where future events go, whether this um, or other webinars and so on that we conduct throughout the year. And we really, truly hope this was a valuable program for you. I know it was for us. And, you know, we look forward to continuing the conversations, continuing to collaborate around our, you know, really, really important and critical challenges that we're all facing. And thank you again for participating and in the user conference in general. And check out other SIGs as well today. So thanks and have a, have a great rest of your day.